Welcome to part three, the Civil War, America in Conflict. Last time we talked about the expansion into the West and how adding new states also meant deciding whether they were free or slave states and how that added to the conflict between the North and the South. This time we're looking at the election of Abraham Lincoln and how it angered the South so much they would actually leave the Union. So grab your headphones and pump up the volume. We're going to hip hop our way to a whole new hit single of learning. Check out these moves. Mm, yeah. Mm. Last lesson we left off talking about bleeding Kansas and how the question of slavery in the new states created conflict after conflict between free and slave states. Well, in 1857, something happened that would make the entire series of arguments and compromises irrelevant. In 1857, a court decision would be handed down that would change the entire argument over free and slave states. You see, Dred Scott was a slave who for part of his life was taken to a free territory by his owner to live and work. After returning to their home in Missouri, he, with the help of a lawyer, filed a lawsuit claiming that since he was taken to a free area, he should be free. After receiving conflicting rulings from lower courts, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. After hearing the case, the Supreme Court ruled that Dred Scott had no right as a slave to sue in a courtroom, and his status was that of property. Furthermore, it would violate the Constitution if his owner wasn't able to take his property wherever he wanted. This meant you could own slaves anywhere in the U.S., even states that outlawed slavery. This made all past compromises worthless and future compromises virtually impossible, as it would not matter whether a state was free or slave, because slaves would be allowed everywhere. Even though the Dred Scott decision seemed like a great decision for the South, it actually contributed to the rise of the Republican Party. The Republican Party was founded in 1854 on the principles of free labor, which meant no slavery, free land, which didn't mean giving away land, it was just objecting to the system in which the wealthy plantation owners in the South buy up all the best land and leave everyone else with the rest, which of course wasn't the best land. And finally, free men, allowing all people to be free of repression by those in power. The Republican Party was the first political party to oppose slavery that had a large enough following to win an election. Earlier attempts by the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party, which even ran former President Martin Van Buren, met little success. Abraham Lincoln became the Republican Party's nominee for the election of 1860 and won the election with his excellent public speaking and debating skills. His main opponent was Stephen Douglas, author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Both of them spent months touring the country having public debates over the issues of the day. Now, about why the election of Abraham Lincoln outraged the South. Obviously, he was part of a political party that was against slavery, but that was only part of the equation. Let's take a look at the map of Lincoln's victory. First of all, like the country, the Democratic Party was divided into the Northern and the Southern Democratic parties. They were, of course, divided over the issue of slavery, just like the country was. Second of all, there was something called the Constitution Party. It didn't last long. It died out after this election. But it did take votes from three Southern states. This made it a four-way race between the two Democrats, the Constitution Party, and the Republican Party. If we look at the results, we see that 59% of the electoral vote went to Lincoln. However, he only captured 40% of the popular vote. If you look closer, you'll see that Lincoln won the election without winning a single southern state. Remember our conversation in Lesson 1 about states' rights? Well, when Abraham Lincoln won the election without winning a single southern state, it meant that the North had elected the leader for the South. The southern states saw no reason to be part of a country that elected a leader that none of them voted for. So with the southern states' rights in jeopardy, one at a time, they would choose to secede or leave the United States, starting with South Carolina in December of 1860. Eleven states would leave the United States to form the Confederate States of America. If you recall, from earlier in the year, we talked about the Articles Confederation. This served as America's first government. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states had all the power and the federal government had very little to none. This is what the southern states saw as a solution to their problems they faced under the government of the United States. After the southern states seceded, President Lincoln had to make a choice to let them go or force them back into the Union. Letting them go would make a new nation to the South that would compete for resources in the West and could be a threat in the future if it became more powerful. At the same time, the huge advantages the North had in population and infrastructure caused most people to think a war to force them back into the Union wouldn't last a week, with an easy victory by the North. Lincoln decided he would preserve the Union and bring the South back into the country. Even though it was Lincoln's decision, the North would not fire the first shot. Fort Sumter was a Union fort in Southern territory. The Confederates sent a message to the fort demanding surrender. When the Union army refused to give up the fort, the Confederates bombarded it with cannon fire. The next morning, Union soldiers surrendered the fort. In the first shots fired in the Civil War, no one would die, 
However, it was the start of the bloodiest war ever fought on America's shores. The first official battle of the war was the Battle of Bull Run, unless you're from the South. Then it would be called the Battle of Manassas. Many people thought it would be the last battle of the war. Most Americans thought the larger army of the North would simply march down to Richmond, Virginia, and take the Confederate capital, ending the war. The reality, however, was much different. Instead of a quick and easy victory for the North, it turned into a rout by the South. The angry and more experienced Southern troops would take the first battle, but both sides would see major losses and quickly see that this war was not going to be over quick. Even though the land battles were very competitive, with both sides seeing major victories, the same could not be said about the battles at sea. The Union controlled the entire Navy and used it to block Southern ports and move troops over rivers. The Confederates did not give up without a fight, however. It was the Confederate Navy that would prove the need to change the way ships were built all over the world. In 1859, the French and English navies were experimenting with putting armor over wooden ships to protect it from enemy cannon fire. After the war started, the Confederates recovered the USS Merrimack, which the U.S. Navy had burned to prevent the Confederates from using. On the remains of the hull, the Confederate Navy built the CSS Virginia, a wooden ship covered in iron armor that would protect it from enemy cannon fire. After the Union heard the Confederates were working on an ironclad, they began to do the same. The Union ship, the USS Monitor, however, was not an iron-covered boat, but was instead made from iron. Once Confederates finished the construction of the CSS Virginia, they sailed into Chesapeake Bay to try and break through the Union blockade that was hurting the Confederate cause. The CSS Virginia quickly sank two Union wooden ships and started on a third when nightfall came. In the morning, it returned to finish the job to find that the Union ironclad the USS Monitor had arrived to protect the fleet. An epic battle ensued between these two ships. I think we have some footage of this event. Boom! Bonk! Boom! Bonk! Boom! Bonk! Boom! Bonk! For more than three hours, both ships fired cannon at each other without being able to inflict any damage. At the end of the battle, both ships left, and the blockade remained in place. The Battle of the Ironclads was the first in the world, and proved that wooden ships would no longer suffice if you wanted to have a world-class navy. So what? Well, after watching this video, you should be able to answer the following questions. How did Abraham Lincoln's election lead to the southern states seceding? What happened at the Battle of Bull Run, and what did it show about the war? Finally, what were ironclads, and how did they change the way navies were built around the world? If you learned all that, then you'll learn, learn, learn what you needed to know. Tune in next time when we talk about how the need for shoes led to the end of the Civil War.